Hello, uh, this is John Perham. Um, <clears throat> in this uh, couple of tutorials, I'm going to talk, to talk about the solution of partial differential equations using the method of separation of variables. And I'm going to do that in connection with the Math 2019 Engineering Mathematics Tutorial Problems 118 and 119. And my name's John Perham from the School of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of New South Wales. So let's get started. So the first problem, problem 118, is about the heat conduction equation. And here it is. Um, this is the heat conduction equation uh, for the temperature V of X and T um, in a bar occupying the region 0 less than X less than 1. Um, and uh, uh, so this is what it is here. Um, and uh, the, we can establish the, this partial differential equation as a Mathematica object using this. So probably a good idea to see how uh, Mathematica deals with partial derivatives. And uh, we can see that the first term here uh, uh, it has this form, and it's the partial derivative of V with respect to its second variable, which is T. And here we've got uh, V of 2, 0, and that means the second partial derivative of uh, V with respect to the first variable X. So that's equivalent to this, except that I've moved uh, this over onto the uh, uh, over onto the left hand side, uh, and so this uh, is the uh, is equal to zero. And the boundary condition, um, well, <clears throat> the boundary condition is sorry, the initial condition is that uh, uh, the left half of the bar or the wire, or whatever you want to do, that think of it as, um, is hot, and the right half. So the temperature there is alpha, and the right half is cold. It's, it has temp temperature zero, and that's at t equals zero. And uh, we have some boundary conditions, and they are that the ends of the bar are insulated, so the, there is no heat flux there. And since the heat flux is proportional to the uh, partial derivative with respect to x, then this quantity it must be zero at x equals zero and x equals L. And the problem is to find V of X and T. So we do that by assuming a solution of the form uh, uh, V of X and T uh, at the form of X of X T times T of T. Um, so this assigns uh, this value to this variable. And uh, we can differentiate that solution with respect to t. You, we better establish it first um, using that. And we can differentiate with respect to t to get that. And we can find the second partial derivative with respect to x uh, using that. And we can insert these uh, values into the differential equation using this. And we can see that if we divide this by the product of x of x times t of t, uh, then uh, we'll get something useful. So let's do that. And um, what we get is <coughs> that t prime of t um, is equal to x double prime of x. Um, uh, and since uh, t and x can be varied independently, this means that this and this must be equal to some constant. And we'll take that constant to be minus lambda squared um, for reasons which will become apparent. So let's uh, uh, start to look at the differential equation for t, because that's the simplest one. So uh, we can extract that using this. And this is a simple first order linear differential equation. We know that it has exponential solutions, so we can solve that using this. And let's get this up here. 
and uh, that solution is a constant, uh, which won't matter in the end, uh, times the exponential of minus lambda squared t. So this uh, tends to zero, uh, provided lambda is real, of course, as t tends to infinity. Uh, and that, uh, so uh, of course, if we'd chosen lambda to be plus, or the separation constant to be plus lambda squared, then this would grow exponentially. And that would be in uh, contradiction to the laws of thermodynamics. So uh, that's why we've chosen this form for the separation constant. What does that imply for x of x? Well, um, we can uh, write or ex uh, extract the differential equation for x of x to give this. Um, and uh, this we've got the minus sign here because we've shifted things about a bit. And uh, we can we can see that this should have uh, trigonometric solutions and we can find those using that. Not to waste time doing that. So uh, the solution for the function x of x is a constant times the cosine of 2x lambda uh, plus another constant times the sine. And the way we find these constants is to apply the boundary conditions. So uh, let's put problem 219 away. So we apply the boundary conditions to that. And to do that, we need to differentiate our solution for x uh, with respect to uh, the variable. So we differentiate that, and it gives us this. Now, this has to be 0 at both ends of the bar. If, remember that our, it has to be multiplied by our solution for t, but that's never 0. Um, so, uh, so let's apply those conditions. So we'll uh, take our uh, solution, uh, the de sorry, the derivative of our solution, and set x equals 0 and x equals 1. And that will give us some equations here. <clears throat> and if we look at that, we can see there are two equations, uh, uh, both of which have to be 0, uh, and, and, and this uh, a second one here. So let's look at the first one first. It's the simplest. And we can see there are two possibilities. Either uh, lambda has to be equal to 0, or c2 has to be equal to 0. Well, um, if lambda is 0, then um, we can see that the second equation is automatically satisfied. And uh, so uh, lambda equals 0 implies that the solution is a constant. And uh, that's the case. Um, so uh, this is one form of the solution. x of x, t of t, is a 0, a constant. And if lambda is not 0, then c2 must be 0. And uh, so uh, um, that should simplify the second equation. We take the second equation and set c2 equal to 0 in it, then we'll find this. <coughs> now, either lambda is 0, which we've already dealt with, or c1 is 0. Uh, or this is 0. So let's suppose that c1 is 0. Well, what does that mean for the solution? Well, if we go back and look at it, we can see that uh, c2 is already 0. So if c1 is 0 as well, then in that case, the solution would be identically 0, which of course will always be a solution, but it doesn't really help us much. It's called the trivial solution. So we conclude that this, this must be 0 here. Sine 2 lambda equals 0. Well, that will be the case if lambda is an integer multiple of pi over 2. So we can write that here. And so we can establish that, that uh, lambda solution is um, that. And um, we can check that that's the case. Um, so, well, not check this case. We can um, 
insert that into the solution and simplify the result using the condition that n be positive uh, and that n is an integer. So n is a positive integer. And uh, that's what the solution looks like. It's a constant, uh, which happens to be the, have the same name as the constant in the T solution. But we'll worry about that in a minute. So we now have the solution for x of x times t of t. Uh, we can establish that using this. And um, that's what it looks like. Uh, I've set c1 in the t solution equal to 1, uh, so that because uh, we only want one constant. Um, and um, it has this form. So for any value of any integer value of n, uh, this guy here, or this function here, satisfies the differential equation and the boundary conditions. Well, <clears throat> that means that any linear combination of these solutions will also be a solution which satisfies the differential equation and the boundary condition. So we can write that like this and uh, sum it. So we call the coefficient a n uh, a function of n and we sum from n equals 1 to infinity and provided this series converges, which is something we won't worry about in this course uh, too much, uh, then, um, then this will be a solution. How do we find it? Well, we notice that it is uh, a form of some numbers or functions of t times uh, cosine of n pi x. And that's a Fourier series which we learned how to calculate. So uh, how do we do that? How do we calculate those coefficients? Well, um, we uh, uh, use the initial condition. So we set x equals 0 in this expression and we know what this is it's the it's the uh, it's equal to alpha for x less than zero and zero for x sorry for x less than a half and uh, alpha for, uh, and one no sorry alpha for x less than uh, x greater than a half okay so uh, these functions here are called eigenfunctions uh, and we need to show that they're orthogonal. It's all, I mean, they are orthogonal, but we may have done something wrong in our calculation, so we should check. So the first eigenfunction is just the number one, the constant, and uh, so we multiply that by our eigenfunction uh, for n and integrate the result from zero to one, and we require that n is an integer and that n is positive. So we can do that, and we can see that those integrals are all zero. And then we multiply uh, eigenfunction number n with eigenfunction number m, and we integrate that across the bar, and we will require that n is an integer, m is an integer, m, n is greater than 0, and we choose m to be greater than n. If you think a bit, that doesn't make any difference. And we do that integral, and we get 0. So all those eigenfunctions are orthogonal, so that means we can um, uh, we can calculate the coefficients. So we just forget the uh, coefficients. We integrate uh, the solution across the bar and apply the initial conditions. And so that integral will be alpha on two, and that will be equal to our constant uh, plus the sum of these integrals. And by the orthogonality result, we just proved all these integrals here are zero. So the result is just a zero. So we've found a zero. It's alpha on two. <clears throat> to find the other Fourier coefficients, then we uh, multiply the solution by an I any old eigenfunction. We'll say m and integrate across the bar. And, uh, and then uh, we get this integral here. And if m is an integer, it's zero. And then we'll get this sum of these integers or these integrals here uh, for uh, over n. And by our, our orthogonality relation, um, those integrals will be zero unless m is equal to n. 
So that's that. Uh, it will be AM times this integral here. And uh, we can uh, um, uh, calculate uh, um, these results here. We integrate uh, alpha from 0 to a half. That's where the temperature is non-zero. And we subtract off the integral of the right-hand side and require that m be an integer. And that gives me this expression for um, well, <coughs> this equation, which is a, a simple linear equation for AM, which I, we can do by setting the whole thing equal to zero and solving for AN. <coughs> and we can see that um, if M is an even integer, then this will be the sine of an integer times pi, which we know to be zero. So we conclude that uh, that m must be an odd integer. So we replace m by 2k plus 1, where 2k plus 1, where k, sorry, is an integer uh, or zero. So we do that. And uh, there's a solution. So uh, we've got it. We can see... Uh, um, that's what it looks like, and we just take the sum of these, and that will be the solution, provided it converges. And we, we can see that it will indeed converge for any positive value of t, because uh, these terms will drop off exponentially. So let's see what the solution looks like. So what I'm going to do is to take 10 terms in the solution, like so, and then I'm going to draw a graph of the solution for some small values of t, uh, t equals 0 0.001, and then five times longer, 0 0.01, and so on. So uh, let's see what that picture looks like. And there it is there. So uh, you can see that uh, the solution with the wiggles uh, is the solution at the very earliest time, and uh, it looks very much like the step function, a bit rounded off. And as t increases, you can see that the solution uh, uh, smooth, uh, gets smoother, and that's because it's converging faster because of the exponential terms. And uh, interestingly enough, the solution at th this boundary here stays one for quite a while um, until, in fact, this front uh, hits there and then it starts to go down so uh, and that's what we'd expect we'd expect the temperature in the in the bar to tend to some uniform value of a half so let's look at it for longer times and uh, that looks like that can be done using that and um, you can see that for the longest time uh, t equals 2 here that effectively the solution has flattened out to be to the value a half all the way across the cell, which or the bar, sorry, which is of course the uh, state of thermodynamic equilibrium. And uh, another way of representing the solution is to uh, plot it in three dimensions. So we, so this is the temperature here, and along this axis is time and along this axis position. So you can see the thing flattening out um, to that value. So um, let's uh, have a little bit of a break here, and um, we'll go on to problem 119.